and welcome to Vimamsa Foundation for Hindi Studies fourth Foundation Day lecture. Vimamsa Foundation is a research forum which focuses on understanding India and studying India in a well-rooted, objective, authentic Indian way by incorporating in the research a perspective which is rooted in the value system. And we do that through well-researched articles, special article series, podcasts, video lectures, interviews, study groups, workshops, and much more. This year, we are marking the fourth year of our foundation, and we are indeed privileged to have with us Dr. Amrita Narekar to deliver the Foundation Day lecture. Dr. Amrita Narekar's research expertise lies in the areas of international negotiations, world trade organization, multilateralism, and India's foreign policy and strategic thought. She is a non resident senior fellow at the Observer Research Foundation. Uh, she is also honorary fellow at Darwin College at University of Cambridge and a non-resident distinguished fellow at Australia India Institute at University of Melbourne. She also served as a president of German Institute for, for Global and Asia Studies from 2014 to 2024 and simultaneously held a full professorship in international relations at University of Hamburg. Before moving to Germany, she taught at University of Cambridge, where she was a full tenured reader in international political economy. She read her MPhil and DPhil at Balliol, Oxford, and also held a junior research fellowship at St. John's College at Oxford. She was all, previously, she was also uh, at St. Stephen's College in New Delhi and was also at the School of International Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University. She's also a very prolific author and has published extensively at world-renowned uh, uh, publications. Some of her uh, books include Poverty Narratives and Power Paradoxes in International Trade Negotiations and Beyond, which was published by Cambridge University Press, The How Not to Guide for International Relations, uh, Bargaining with a Rising India Lessons from Mahabharata, and strategic choices, ethical dilemmas, stories from Mahabharata. The last two are going to be our main focus of discussion today, and she, she will be speaking on the topic, Ancient Roots of Global Bharat. There is an increasing curiosity about India, as India is rising at the global stage, and importantly, there is also curiosity about Indian understanding about global affairs, as more and more ideas about this come to the fore. These two books are a very important contribution to the academic and uh, for general readers alike, which tries to bring to the fore the strategic thought and its practical utility in understanding Indian approach to global affairs and also understanding some of the ways through which India is trying to address the global problems. We are indeed privileged to have Dr. Narayikar to deliver this lecture. Uh, I thank you, Dr. Narayikar, and I invite you to please uh, share with us your insights about this topic. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Ranade, for inviting me to do this Foundation Day lecture. And let me congratulate you and your team for the work that you are doing at the Mimamsa Foundation. Now, let me check if I am able to screen share with you. I hope that's working. Yes, yes. Okay, so it's a pleasure for me to be here. And I'm looking forward uh, to, to engaging with you in, in, in a dialogue on some of the questions that I know you are also researching and have a long-standing interest in. So my presentation today is uh, in three parts. As you know, the lecture is called The Ancient Roots of Global Bharat. But before jumping into the specifics of this issue, I want to say a little bit about why the study of ancient Indian texts matters for international relations and why scholars of international relations should pay attention to these topics. Then I will speak about the ancient roots of global Bharat, 
And in the third section of my lecture, I will say, I will give just a couple more illustrations uh, from our latest book, Strategic Choices and Ethical Dilemmas, Stories from the Mahabharat. Okay, so... Um, Just... Sorry about that. Okay, so why study ancient texts as a scholar of international relations? Now, well over a decade ago, as a scholar of international negotiation, I noticed that there were several books available on the negotiation cultures of other countries, including China and Japan. But there was nothing on India. And this seems like a very serious gap in the scholarship to me. How is it possible that there was such little interest in the negotiation culture and strategic thought of a civilizational power like India and whose living past was likely to influence current mindsets? So my co-author, Dr. Aruna Narlikar and I wrote a book, Bargaining with a Rising India, which you can see on the PowerPoint on the left, Bargaining with a Rising India, Lessons from the Mahabharat, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2014. Now, in this book, we use the Mahabharat as a lens to better understand India's negotiation culture. Most people, even in popular parlance, tend to think of the Mahabharat as a story of war. So for example, if there are people fighting in a family, one hears, Unke ghar mein to Mahabharat chal rahi hai. right? But in fact, most of the Mahabharat is about negotiation. Only five of the 18 parva or volumes, Bhishma parva, Drone parva, Karna parva, kar Karna Parva, Shalya Parva, and Sautika Parva, only these five are about war itself. And even these five include important lessons on negotiations in wartime, within one's own sides, with one's allies, and also in dealing with the enemy. The other volumes are very much about bargaining during peacetime or pre-war negotiations, and then post-war negotiations too. And the Mahabharata, as you know, and some of our viewers will also be aware, has many side stories and stories within stories, which also have fascinating insights on negotiations. And besides the stories of the Mahabharat, it's, so the stories themselves are fascinating. They give us great insights, but it's also, it was also very important for us that the stories are deeply embedded in the psyche of our people. So children are still named after heroes of our great epic. References to its villains abound. And there are many cultural references to the text in our daily lives. And so for several reasons, in order to fill the gap in the literature on India's negotiation culture, we chose to go to the Mahabharata. And I'm proud to say that this book was the first of its kind with reference to India. And we're very grateful to Oxford University Press for having supported this ambitious, and some would have said at the time, even risky project in 2013, 2014. Now, a major driver for us then was to recognize the role that India's ancient texts have played in shaping the country's negotiation behavior, but also its strategic thought. And it was frustrating to see that while there were plenty of work, works in, that, that, that studied Western thinkers, right? So from Aristotle and Plato to Machiavelli and Clausewitz, and there were also such works in relation to other cultures, such as China, there was a real paucity of such analyses in relation to India. 
And we decided to write this book because we wanted to fill this gap. And like I said, we wanted to do this because it was intellectually fascinating, but also because we thought it important to have greater self-awareness within India of the country's long-standing negotiations tr traditions and also strategic narratives. We were also convinced that the knowledge of and interest in these approaches would help India's partners negotiate more effectively and constructively with it. So the response to this first book that you see in the PowerPoint on the left was very encouraging. And this is reflected in the several other books that have followed ours on this topic, as well as appreciative reviews that the book continues to generate. But just as great was the positive, positive feedback from policymakers from different countries who told us that the book had enriched their understanding as well as their negotiation efficacy. So both Aruna and I felt that we should communicate the relevance of some of India's ancient wisdom to a wider audience. And so Aruna wrote articles for the Times of India's Speaking Tree column. And I started doing little videos on Twitter where I would recite, explain, and apply the relevance of some of my favorite Sanskrit shlok, Sanskrit verses. Now, the public reaction to this was enthusiastic. And this is when we started toying with the idea of doing a new book that would apply the lessons of the Mahabharat to questions of foreign policy and strategy, as well as the dilemmas that we face in our everyday lives. And we were clear that this new book would be written not just from a perspective of understanding India for both insiders and outsiders, which is what the first book has, had done, but instead this new book would apply the treasure trove of Indian wisdom, wisdom from the Mahabharat, to questions of global significance and global reach. And we found a wonderful partner in crime in Professor Amitabh Mathu. We brought our different expertise together, Aruna from literature, Amitabh from security studies and foreign policy, me from international political economy and international negotiation. And we considered a range of angles that we could take we thought about doing character analyses, specific themes, maybe even go with the chapter ordering of the Mahabharata itself. But then Aruna suggested that we use the medium of stories because ultimately it is the stories that we remember. It's the stories that shape us, they make us who we are. And then when Penguin Random House agreed to publish the book, this was quite the icing on the cake. And so in the PowerPoint, the book that you see on the right um, is this book. It was published a few months ago at the end of 2023. And both books are available in bookstores and online. And they, and like I said, they perform different tasks. And I hope they will stimulate some of our listeners, some of our viewers, and encourage them to do more, further work in this area. And so having given that background, I will now turn to the announced theme of my lecture today, the ancient roots of global Bharat, uh, which draws on some of the research that I have been doing on these topics over the past couple of years. So the ancient roots of global Bharat. And transcending the vagaries of empires, invasions, dynasties, and governments. I would argue that there is an idea of global Bharat that runs deep in Indian strategic thought. While its ancient and diverse traditions have sh long shaped the diplomacy and negotiation traditions of this civilizational state, 
recent years have seen an increasing commitment by Indian leaders to, I would say, own India's intellectual past. So India's G20 presidency was built around the theme of Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, one earth, one family, one future. And this is this this theme for the G20 presidency is a powerful illustration of how the country is systematically reclaiming a global approach inherent in its traditions. And this strategy of ownership and reclaim has domestic and international ramifications. So even as the term finds greater usage and traction with global leaders and people on the ground, it's important, I would say it's very important to ensure that the profound and far-reaching idea of Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam is not reduced to just another glib catchphrase. So in this main part of my lecture, I want to do three things. I will unpack the full meaning of the phrase, highlighting a key aspect that is often lost in current applications of the term. In the second step, I will draw out the far-reaching implications of the concept for a Bharatiya vision of global order. And in the third step, I will explain why a global order that is based on this idea, on the idea of Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, is not some mere utopian vision. Rather, while taking an, a clear ethical stand, it can be reconciled with a robust realism that will advance the country's interests as well as those of other like-minded partners. So let's start talking about Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam and thinking about recognizing the reach of this concept. And Akshay, if I'm not mistaken, in sim this is also a motto of symbiosis, right? The idea of- Yes, yes. Yeah. So you, so many of your students will be well aware of this. Many faculty and students will know this verse. And- uh, right. And the verse is, I am Nijaha Paro Veti Ganana Laghu Chetasam Udara Charita Nam Tu Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam. It's from the Mahopanishad and it translates into, this is mine, this is yours. Only mean-minded people indulge in such calculations. For the generous-minded, the entire earth is one family. Now, even as references to this verse find greater popularity within India and internationally, two points are worth emphasizing. First, most engage with the idea of the entire earth as one family on an understanding that this refers to all the peoples of this world. As per this interpretation, we should be looking beyond our national borders and acting in the interests of our shared humanity. This well-intended interpretation, however, stifles the much more ambitious and inclusive nature of the concept. The fact is that Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam refers not just to people of the earth, but also the more than human beings. The animals, the plants, all the different creatures to whom this planet also belongs. All these beings are members of this global family. Those who have no vote, who have no, va no voice, matter just as much in this Bharatiya idea of a global family as those who do have votes and those who do have voice. Second point worth emphasizing. Is that this one phrase has gained popularity in Indian diplomacy and public discourse 
should not lead cynics to assume that its supporters have cherry-picked an exception in Indian thought. Multiple Sanskrit sources offer us a non-anthropocentric, trans-species, global perspective, similar to the one that Vasudhai Vakutumbakam ex exemplifies. And this is true not only of esoteric texts that a small number of religious scholars have the language skills to read, but also the living traditions and stories that are passed on from grandparents to grandchildren every day. So for instance, the Mahabharat, which deals with some of the most fundamental questions in politics, negotiation and war, contains within it a story, and this is one of my favorite stories from the Mahabharat. And it's a story about one of its heroes, Yudhishthir, who is clear that he would renounce paradise. He would give up paradise rather than abandon a stray dog who has faithfully accompanied him on his final journey. Now, in the argumentation that he offers Indra, the king of the gods. Especially striking is Yudhishthir's adamant refusal to accept a distinction between humans and animals. Instead, he effectively attributes personhood and rights to all beings. Several other stories in this epic offer similar lessons on the importance of treating one's fellow beings, human or not with dignity and respect. And the Mahabharat is not alone in offering a holistic con 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 conception of the global. The Ramayan similarly emphasizes the importance of trans-species cooperation. For example, in the successful alliance that Lord Ram establishes with the monkey king Sugriv, as highlighted by our foreign minister, Dr. Jai Shankar, in his latest book. And school children in India are similarly exposed to lines that remind them of an equality that extends across all species. So, for example, I grew up with the idea of Atmavat Sarvabhute Shu Yahapashyati Sahapanditaha. He who looks upon all creatures as he looks upon himself, he is the truly wise one. So this idea of Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam is not only about all that we should think about and care for all humanity and all the people of peoples of this planet. It's a shorthand for a rich, non-anthropocentric globalism. Accept and embrace the philosophy of the unique universalism inclusiveness and pluralism that it stands for. And this part of the vision of global order takes on a special relevance today. So let me tell you a little bit about what I see as the, as the implications of this idea, Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, for global order and governance. So as policymakers turn much needed attention to urgent issues, including climate change, Bharat offers a vision that is more original, I would argue, and more timely than dominant ones in the West. So take, for example, the narrative about climate change mitigation. School children have been taking to the streets, especially in Europe, but also in other parts of the world, with their Fridays for Future demonstrations. These school strikes for climate have been inspired by Greta Thunberg's call. And I now quote her. What she said in one of her speeches was, you have stolen my dreams and my childhood. You are failing us, but the young people are starting to understand your betrayal, the eyes of all future generations are upon you. And if you choose to fail us, I say, we will never forgive you. End of quote by Greta Thunberg. Now, this is a narrative that's been embraced, appreciated, 
in the call for climate action. And for all its merits, this is a narrative primarily about intergenerational justice, which is what one would expect if we applied Western tenets of liberalism. But if we draw on Bharat's approach, we get a much more inclusive global narrative for climate change. And such a, such a narrative, a Bharatiya narrative, requires not only intergenerational justice, but also trans species justice. It, it attaches urgency to the cause of biodiversity preservation, but also to save the lives of individual anim animals within species. It's not only about the species, it's about animal rights, individual animals within species. And such differences in narratives matter because they lead to potentially different policies and outcomes. Now, as part of its G20 presidency, India has already begun to shape the global narrative. The Delhi Declaration is clear, for example, in highlighting its respect for the environment. What it says is, it is with the philosophy of living in harmony with our surrounding ecosystem that we commit to concrete actions to address global challenges. This commitment is explicit in the text via its attention to questions of sustainability, just energy transition, circular economy, the idea of life, lifestyle for the environment. And reflecting the impact that India's frame of Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam has had, the preamble also accords importance to the planet in its own right. These are very important developments. They should not be underestimated. But that said, and despite its many merits, the Delhi Declaration is primarily a human-centric one. So, for example, the Declaration states, we're building towards, through these actions today, we're building towards a system that better empowers countries to address global challenges is human-centric and brings prosperity and well-being to humanity. End of quote. To apply the philosophy and in, that is encapsulated in the phrase of Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, the next step will be not, not only to focus on human-centric development, but planet-centric development. The Bharatiya vision of global order allows and encourages us to pay attention not only to human suffering, but also to the suffering of our more than human fellow creatures. And similarly, when speaking of one health, Despite the key issues that the Delhi Declaration raises, Bharat will be able to push for a focus on protecting the health and welfare also of other species, not least in the context of zoonotic jumping and pandemic prevention. So Bharat's non-anthropocentric perspective is fundamental to addressing a range of problems including biodiversity loss, climate change, sustainable development. The fact that global debates have still not mainstreamed Bharat's perspective partly helps explain why progress on these issues has been so slow and innovative solutions have been difficult to find. Bharat's vision also has real life implications for each and every one of us. The sooner we stop thinking about this planet as belonging to our children and our children's children, the sooner we will be able to address the issues of consumerism, meat and dairy consumption, and so on and so forth. It also has implications for foreign policy. So we would build closer partnerships among countries that share the core values of life lifestyle for the environment as advanced by Prime Minister Modi. And 
allowing the life concept to come to fruition, we would focus not only on human-centric development, but planet-centric development. And we would speak not only about intergenerational justice, but trans-species justice. And a global Bharat, as it advances such a vision of global order, would also lead the way in reforming global governance. That it is already walking its talk in making international institutions more inclusive is evident from the fact that the African Union acquired membership of the G20 during India's presidency. But, but take this idea, this Bharatiya vision further, apply the non-anthropocentric global vision to multilateralism, and we see that India is already doing its part, for example, via the International Big Cat Alliance. It can lead the way even further on this, for instance, by pushing for a global ban on trophy hunting and joining countries like New Zealand in banning the live ex export of animals. Bharat has powerful cultural traditions that are inspired by Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, but also cross religious barriers, you know, across these religious barriers that and ideas that enter and form a part of our cultural ethos. And these powerful cultural traditions could inspire a new form of global order, which enables not only a greater voice of the global south, which India has been advancing, but also trans species compassion and respect. So now I've given you the argument of how the idea of Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, if you apply it, could significantly improve the global order, not only for humans, but for a variety of beings. But you might turn around and say, what does this have to do? Okay, great, you're talking about values, but what about interests? Which brings me to the third part of, 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 of my lecture on global Bharat, ethics and real, real politique. So the Bharatiya global agenda has I that I've just presented has the potential to offer fresh innovative ideas to deal with existential crises, including climate change, di declining biodiversity, pandemics. It has the potential to reboot and re-energize the system of multilateral rules, to, in to inject new levels of fairness in a much more inclusive trans-species understanding of justice in a way that has never been done before and needs to be done. But like I said, an immediate comeback on the argument that I've just given to you is likely going to be, how will adopting this value-based globalism actually advance Indian interests? And as I've argued elsewhere, Indian strategic thought shows us some interesting ways to overcome the values versus interest dichotomy that is so common, commonly discussed in international relations IR theory debates. So for example, in the Mahabharat, we have the idea, again, it comes from Yudhishthir in the Yaksha Prashna episode, when Yudhishthir says, Dharma evo, Dharma eva hato hanti dharmo rakshati rakshataha. When dharma, duty or values, when dharma is destroyed, it also destroys. Dharma protects those who guard it, who protect it. This is not a shallow understanding of values, but it is a deep one that suggests that both values and interests are reflexive, with one shaping the other. Attention to values is thus not a soft issue. Rather, an effective use of ethics is crucial for real politique. 
So India's expansive non-anthropocentric globalism will be of natural advantage to India. It originates in Bharat. And it is an approach on which Bharat can offer thought leadership and action leadership. This will matter. This will matter a great deal, not only in terms of Bharat's status and growing influence, but also in the selection of its trade and security partners. So just as democratic values and shared histories have offered countries, some countries from the global South and the global North to find commonalities with each other, I would argue that Bharat's planet-centric focus can offer another significant line of like-mindedness. This in turn would translate into closer ties with such like-minded partners and also diversified supply chains from others with important geoeconomic and security implications. Via closer cooperation with a critical mass of countries that come to share the same respect for life across species, a global Bharat would play a major role in building a more sustainable, a more secure, a more inclusive, but very importantly, a kinder world. So far then, I've, just dis I've, I've discussed the vision and implications of a global Bharat that is rooted in one of India's ancient traditions. Now, let me share just a couple of further insights to show you the range of ideas that our ancient texts offer for modern day problems. And in doing this, I will draw on our latest book, Strategic Choices, Ethical Dilemmas, Stories from the Mahabharat. So first, the Mahabharat itself, and also the first story, that we use, that we give in our book. The, the story of the Mahabharat begins with a powerful alliance. And that alliance is between Ganesh, the god of creativity, the first to be worshipped, and Ved Vyas, the poet who composed, the sage poet who composed the Mahabharat. And this story, as well as several others in our book, offer insights on the importance of alliances. And not only alliances that work, but also the fa of failed alliances, the dangers of going it alone, how to negotiate even amongst friends, and both the how-tos, but also the how-not-tos of building alliances and partnerships. And given that my DPhil from Balliol Oxford was on coalitions of developing countries and international trade, this is an area that I continue to work on. And I must confess that I have a soft spot for all the insights, and there are many insights, that the Mahabharat offers us on questions of alliances and collective action. Second example, the Mahabharat also helps us address some seemingly modern problems. The story of the great teacher and mighty warrior Dronacharya and how he is demobilized in the great war by the Pandavas with reference to Ashwatthama, Narova, Kunjarova. Ashwatthama, Ashwatthama is killed, man or elephant. That episode reveals a lot about disinformation and how disinformation, misinformation, and fake news are used, how the source can make a huge difference. Dronacharya does not believe the news until Yudhishthir comes and says, Ashwatthama is dead, Narova Kunjarova, which he matters. Now the source matters. And what strategies are used to curtail verification? And Thus, the Mahabharat also offers us helpful insights on how some of these problems can be overcome. And isn't it remarkable that although most of us think that disinformation is a problem of the digital era, the Mahabharat, our ancient epic, manages to teach us something on this too. And there's plenty more 
in the Mahabharat, but also in our slim book, which we deliberately kept slim because we wanted people to engage, to read it, um, to to think about it. We've, you know, we some of these these lessons from the Mahabharat. And these are lessons on how to maintain resolve, when to show flexibility, how to work with allies, how to um how to create dissension amongst allies, the meaning of ecologism, uh, trans species balance and justice, and so much more. So let me stop there, Akshay. And I'm very much looking forward to our exchange and also engaging with the questions that you've crowdsourced. Thank you. Uh, hello, Doctor. Thank you very much. I think that was a very uh, to the point and I think very uh, uh, specific way. Uh, a lot of time we hear Mahabharat in a very general sense of the way, yes, we had a strategic thought and so forth. But how to sort of filter it down and talk about specifics, I think this was very insightful in that sense that it's the, the session actually talked about certain specifics which actually uh, help us understand the thought as such. Um, so uh, we at Mimamsa Foundation had already circulated about the uh, about this lecture and we were gathering some questions and I was very glad to receive a whole lot of questions, but due to paucity of time, we have selected a few and I want to run those uh, with you. Um, so there was one question and I think I uh, want to begin with that. Uh, you, The question is actually about the lack of theorization uh, uh, of Indian strategic thought. Uh, the question said that we have a rich thought uh, and we had a rich scholarship, uh, but how is it that we do not read theorization of these thought in academia? What we read about is Western theorization, whether it is the realism, liberalism, dynamo, or uh, any other thing, but we do not see much theorization coming out from India. Uh, why is that? That's a great question. Mm, and I would argue that two the, there's this whole in fact there's it's not only about theory right there's this, this this there was this big debate on why is there no indian strategic thought right and then there are people mm -hmm. who think mm -hmm. there's no ir theory that comes out of india mm -hmm. and i would argue that the problem is that we are using oh, our starting point is a western frame right and so mm -hmm. the starting point is this is the only way to do theory. And the way to do theory is to think about realism, liberalism, and constructivism. And if you're not using that language, then you're not theorizing. All you have is some ideas, right? And I mean, you okay. also see this in the context of liberalism, right? Most discussions on liberalism assume that the West, right? All liberal ideas originate in the West. And it's not even, it's, it's sort of, in very few people will recognize that there may be a possibility, just a possibility, and I would argue it's more than a possibility, it's there, mm -hmm. uh, that you have liberal ideas that are more liberal than variants mm -hmm. of Western liberalism, right? And mm -hmm. so to, and, and you know, I mean, I'm sure you've gotten this question to yourself, Dr. Ranade, uh, mm -hmm. in your teaching, when, you know, when people will come and say, I get this in my, in, you know, I've had these conversations mm -hmm. at the Giga, now where I was president for 10 years, when mm -hmm. I have a colleague who comes and says to me, so isn't Kautilya the Indian Machiavelli? <laughs> that's, yeah. that's a problem, just the way to say, right. you know, isn't right. Shakespeare, no, isn't Kautilya the Indian Shakespeare? <laughs> right? I mean, True. so we need, I would argue that we need, um, this is the moment for us to be really launching in to uh, uh, a new form of scholarship that is just as rigorous, right? Meets the standards mm -hmm. of uh, academic rigor, intellectual rigor, but doesn't use Western scholarship as the starting point. And this mm -hmm. should come from the global South. And I think there'll be differences. Now we'll get different variants of theorizing. Mm -hmm from different parts of the global south and India has a lot to offer that. Right, it's actually very pertinent because um, we also study IR from Westphalia as if uh, it begins from there. But if we were to sort of look back and think on the lines that where do we understand our own state system and ideas from there, probably we'll come to a different. And I think you 
mentioned a very important central piece dharma rakshati rakshita and the central centrality of dharma in not just strategic but in political ethical and across disciplines the centrality of that idea uh, itself is a very pertinent thing to begin with if we want to understand anything around india as in i think understanding dharma is where it begins from and I, if we start sort of theorizing around those lines we could come to more uh, scholarly work as well uh, and that's an, i mean i that's a great example right mm-hmm. choosing dharma as a starting point but you know the big problem in my eyes is most scholarly debates in ir and politics political mm-hmm. science in the west and those are the mainstream debates mm-hmm. unfortunately even now right will mm-hmm. use the starting point now if you say why are you not looking at indian scholarship and they'll go oh yeah i'm looking at 19th century political thought but indian right. political right. thought does not begin in 19th century correct right correct. and that's and that's really a problem right and it's also a little bit like there's discomfort with the idea of culture and civilization right but mm-hmm. india is india's different right from many western countries that with the fact that we have a culture and a civilization and cultures and civilizations that have mm-hmm. uh, that span centuries and even millennia right and so we do need to look at ancient political thought and hmm. some of it is hugely relevant even today but no you know like the best of them will look at 19th century and go look we're looking at history and that's what matters but indian history is old <laughs> true true so um am i also sort of taking that thread ahead am i also writing understanding and if i just wanted to ask you your perspective on that that if someone sort of uh, uses the vocabulary like dharma or ideas which you just mentioned it doesn't have the same respectability when it enters the academic discourse that you have there is some sense of conformity to use the vocabulary which is established and that sort of impedes one to write scholarly work using the vocabulary that you mentioned i think i would agree with that um mm-hmm. and and then add to it so yes i would agree to it agree with what you just said and also because the extreme politicization now that we mm-hmm. see of concepts like dharma right and so uh and i mean to be fair the concept of dharma is complicated as bhishma said right bhishma said mm-hmm. it's dharma is very sukshma right when sure. now when draupadi asks him is this dharma right mm-hmm. so it is a complicated concept then in the current day no in the present day it's very unfairly being politicized in the west right from sort of cent- you know i mean especially like from the center left and center left right mm-hmm. and so the minute you say dharma people will just say oh you're talking about religion but no actually the concept of dharma has like you said huge mm-hmm. um you know ethical ramifications political ramifications which is different from mm-hmm. politicization right but i must That's say right, that right. we also make i mean indian scholars also make it hard for themselves right because you know or bhishma made it hard for himself because something <laughs> it's not that complicated now there are many examples right so when yudhishthir go does you know that story that i told you told you told you and is there in the book that i said is my favorite story now you have the king of the gods not telling yudhishthir leave the dog behind and he gives reasons from dharma now so one of the mm-hmm. reasons he gives is you know if you have a religious sacrifice and a dog looks upon it then uh, that that sacrifice will not be fruitful and then indra gives him several arguments and this is one of them another one is is that leave the dog behind no there's no harm in doing so no you don't it, and 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 yudhishthir doesn't say dharma is complicated or sukshma he says no and don't mm-hmm. leave the dog behind right and at right. no point right. does right. make a distinction between a dog and a person the dog has been loyal right. and in a way he's granting personhood to the dog so sometimes right. we also now there's this whole scholarly hubris that we have you know just the way sometimes we're taught to write in a very complicated way not in an accessible way it's the same problem mm-hmm. right and sometimes okay. it's not that sukshma yeah it's interesting actually that sometimes if, if if you look at simply we probably can understand it simply also mm-hmm. we may not necessarily have to complicate it 
interesting there's one more question and i think you partly alluded to in your uh, uh, in your lecture but i just still want to take that ahead how much of this uh, uh, strategic thought in forms of foreign policy today uh, uh, we all you were just referring to discussions about india not having a strategic thought i mean in tanham's article actually created a lot of ripples here uh, about not having a strategic thought whatsoever uh, but now at least for few past few years there is some embracing of these ideas so how uh, how much do you think this informs of foreign policy generally or would it help us if we informs more uh, again i'm i mean uh, another very good question dr anade no? so um so at one level i would argue that for a civilizational state these ideas have always informed our thinking okay. and just the way right. you have the anal school of history right there mm -hmm. is an idea of mentality mindset right mm -hmm. negotiating culture certain types of narratives that have survived centuries in that sense some of these ideas inform our thinking right our diplomatic mm -hmm. thinking our statecraft right and now this but I would agree with you that in recent years there has been a much more systematic uh, use of this, and I would argue in a in often to the success, often for not all for both India's good but also the global good, right? Mm -hmm. And so we've seen, for example, how over the last ten years the climate change narrative has changed, right? Before it used to be entirely about development, it still is about development. but we have made in in india we have now owned the mitigation narrative right combating climate change narrative by pointing out that protect like like in in a in a speech that i think pm modi made in 2014 2014 or 15 in germany right mm -hmm. what he said was you don't need to lecture to us on protecting the environment these ideas are deeply embedded in our ancient texts these okay. ideas come natural mm -hmm. to us right so it's great that these ideas are being used now but we also have to be aware that they can be used strategically right and it is the job of the scholar to be able to make that distinction now if hmm. possible whether it's be whether these ideas are being used strategically right um and to what end right and this is not only true for india it's true for every it's true for every state um right. you know the appeal to uh certain ideas will be strategic and i think india is using it very effectively and did so very effectively in the g20 right again for mm -hmm. the good and mm -hmm. for india's good right in also i know it, this is again something that you mentioned during your lecture as well that uh, the the globalism as an idea may not necessarily be antagonistic to the pursuit of interest uh, that they both of them can actually go hand in hand and this is something which was a question again uh, but i just want to sort of tweak a bit that question that there was you know is there something beyond vasudev kutumbakam in indian global thought that's what was question was asked uh, but uh, in a sense the way you put it during your lecture you said that vasudeva kutumbakam actually is an aggregate of all different ideas uh, that come together and can be encapsulated as one whether it is trans generational trans species justice or uh, we being sort of a uh, uh, caretaker of everything around us itself is an uh, strategic thought and it doesn't have to go uh, against the interest uh, but uh, i want to sort of take that question ahead in a times when uh, this idea is getting challenged about there is a collective ownership uh, and in india making a pitch for the collective ownership through different idioms that you just mentioned through which narendra modi himself did uh, how far do you think are we able to convince uh, the global community about the or how how far are we able to uh, attract to this uh, how how much is attention at the global level to this idea from your own uh, understanding experiences so there is i would argue that there is a lot of global attention to this idea right mm -hmm. on this collective ownership idea now that this that that the it sort of global solutions are needed for global problems my problem is that 
you have a whole bunch of states that will also misuse this idea, right? Can, show okay. me a state that says it's not collective ownership, right? You know, okay. it's what game theorists would refer to as cheap talk. Talk is cheap. Right? Right, right now, right. in the Indian case, this is why I think it's really important that this idea of Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam is does not just become another phrase, right? And it is a phrase mm -hmm. that is being bandied about by a lot of people, right? But it actually mm -hmm. means something, and it means something really important. And what it means right. is that you know it's not only about collective in ownership in my eyes, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's also about individual rights. Not, right. And it's about right. the individual rights of every single creature. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. every single being, human or more than human or non-human, whatever you want to call call them, right? right. And, and right. that, and that, if you take that version, that is an ex that is a really beautiful version of liberalism. That I, mm -hmm. I, that is not there in the West, right? Because mm -hmm. in the West, it's very human centric liberalism. And right. you can push this agenda, and this agenda is important to push if if we're serious about bio biodiversity, if we're serious about uh, climate change, but also you know sort of if we're serious about wanting to prevent pandemics. So it's an idea mm -hmm. that that should matter mm -hmm. to us for our interests. But I would argue that it's not only useful strategically; it's also important ethically, right? And ethics right. also matter, right? And right. This idea is, and it is one where if you don't use it in that cheap talk way that many other countries will, I think, misuse it, right? But mm -hmm. you use it in a meaningful way for what it stands for, then it really brings together the idea of dharmo rakshati rakshitaha, that it allows us right. to bring together values and interests. And it's, it's, an, it's a very important idea. So I hope India will push for this even more and push its partners and itself right to to make more of it great i think there was i think the, one more thing that just came up when you were answering that uh, which is striking my into my mind was that even liberalism in, if sort of uh, spoken in these terms doesn't have, again that individual identity and collective identity doesn't militate uh, it sort of very comfortably coexist if explained in such a term and that there is a collective ownership but there is an individual existence within that collective sphere as well and i think that uh, very effectively been explained uh, but, but thank I, you yeah, yeah. sorry yeah, just yeah. add to what you just said yeah. right you know yeah, like yeah. you know you remember there's this sort of debate that some of your students might also know uh, and our listeners might know about oh there are universal human rights and then there is sort of asian mm -hmm. values right or mm -hmm. universal values and asian values right the asian values are the ones that are all about society right they're not about mm -hmm. the individual and the indian version takes us much more in the direction of individual right because in sort of uh as a, as a philosophers put it um Ray raimondo panikar right what he said was in india human rights are not human only no? That's such an important right. That's about individual rights. So, so I would say there's Asian values. Liberal values, like the West talks about them, not universal, but Western. And then there's this, Indi this Indian version of values, right? With where human rights are not human only. And I think India, you know, everybody sort of lumps together Asia and puts India in that same group. But this is a very different a much more inclusive, a much more pluralistic understanding of the world, right? And India can and should lead the way on it. Right, right, right. Interesting, actually. I think uh, uh, it was very insightful, uh, the session, and it was like some of the interaction. I uh, There are certain very important cues, I must say, that uh, we as a students can take it from there. And, and if I were to sort of look at it from my perspective, I think there is Im it's important to uh, explain it in a terms which is uh, which has its utility as well as which has uh, connect with the contemporary problems. It should not just be stuck in a time when we're just narrating something, but the way you said that there is a utility to speak it in terms that it will be acceptable for its utility as well. Uh, I think that's a very important takeaway. Uh, essentially, at the times when there is certain uh, uh, 
there's certain acceptance to the fact that is yes, there are certain strategic thoughts which are relevant and which can be used uh, in a in a way that is acceptable to a larger audience and not limited just for india uh, thank you dr narika for that it was really very insightful uh, i'm sure all of us enjoyed it uh, all of us i'll urge everyone to read the both the books uh, the first one is fair, fairly academic and the second one reaches out to more audiences it doesn't confine itself to universities and in fact the purpose if i'm understanding it correctly is to move beyond universities uh, primarily and reach to larger people so i'll urge all of you to please grab it it's off the shelf you can take it it's online available as well please do read it uh, and uh, tell us how do you feel about this lecture how do you feel about what we discussed today um, and if you like this please do share it among your friends and acquaintances as well uh, if you like our other videos other uh, sessions as well please do let us know visit us on www.bharatmimamsa.com where you will also see this video as well as all other activities like our research articles special articles research projects workshop updates and study group updates on our website so i once again want to thank dr narika for giving your time uh, for this session we we really really appreciate that uh, and i hope we keep in touch and you'll guide us further with our other endeavors as well thank you akshay it was i greatly enjoyed the conversation and thank you for the invitation and kudos to you and your team for the work you're doing thank you thank you